Hey, this is Pastor Eric, and we're going to try to do something a little different. I'm going to see if I can share this screen with you. And I want to teach in a little different way. Excuse me, I'm moving around the screen. I want to teach in a little different way the new members class, and I'm trying to do it in a way uh, that's a little different, but hopefully you can see all the notes. So uh, today we're going to talk about Discovering Church Membership Class 101. Now, I have uh, hesitated doing this class on YouTube or Zoom or anything else, but here's what I realize is that um, it's a necessity today. Here's my fears, and so I want you to go out of your way because one of the reasons that we do the new members class the way that we do it is because we want people to connect. So in the new members class, they get to know other people. I get to know you. So if you would do me a favor, if you take this class or if you're taking this class, would you send me an email? Let me know what you thought of the class or somehow let me know about you a little bit more, and maybe we can go out of the way after a service to connect. And uh, at the end of this class, you will see there is a uh, – a membership form that we ask everybody to fill out just a way of committing to us it's not a legal document or anything like that but it is a way for us to know who's committing to our church so let's get down to it if you've got your book uh, uh you'll follow along with us in your book um you can also print this online if you need a book um, we'll get you a book uh to keep up and there's some blanks to fill in to keep you awake all right we're going to talk about discovering church membership and first we're going to talk about part one salvation baptism and the lord's supper we're going to talk about our beliefs as a church and our partnerships and then our purpose and strategy. In this section, you're going to do part one, which is the longest part for this video. And then I'll do a part for two and three, um, and you can watch those separately. In order to fulfill the new membership class requirements, you have to do all three parts and uh, then fill out that form at the end. All right. So here we go. You ready? Uh, hopefully, I'm going to figure out how to do it. I guess this is the way we do it. All right, so normally I have a life-saving station video here. You can Google that and look it up on your, uh, uh, if you Google uh, just the words life-saving station, there is a video and it talks about life uh, boats being sent out and life-saving stations being built. But after they're built, the members begin to only want members. They don't want to actually reach out to other people. And over time, that's what happens to life-saving stations in this video. Now, the truth is, and the tie-in is, that's what happens to churches also. After a while, if we're not careful, all we do is, uh, is we become a church that just wants church people. So we always want to go out of our way. So let me give you a couple things uh, in our church that I want you to know. And some of these are just for you in life, has nothing to do with our church. Here it is. The most important time each day is your personal time with God, time in prayer, time in Bible study. We have a lot of resources for that, but I would encourage you to make that a part of your life. Now, I'm going to move me around so you can see this next one. Our purpose statement, at Surfside, we want to help people find their way home to Christ so they can grow in love with him and invite others home to Christ. And so it's a cycle. We want to help people find their way home. We grow in him. And one of the natural things when you grow in Christ is to help others find their way home to him. Now, here's Surfside's Big Surf. There are, this spells out the word surf, as you can see. Uh, we believe in scripture and prayer. We believe in uniting in small groups, replicating through apprenticing, just like a plumber or an electrician has an apprentice. That's another word for discipleship. We believe in replicating what we do, everything that we do in our church, whether it is running sound, helping with children, whether it is uh, uh, helping uh, greet at the door, whether it's passing an offering plate, whatever it is. Well, we don't do that right now, but, but whatever it is, we want to replicate, teach others to do what we know how to do, and they may even do it better than we do it. And then finally, we believe in four environments for growth. Some of these ideas we got from other people, but all of these ideas come from scripture. So here's our four environments for growth, and I'm going to move me out of the way for just a minute. We want to move people from foyer to the living room, to the kitchen, and then to the backyard. I will explain this further later in the class. That's where we serve around the world. The kitchen is the key place where we grow in our relationships with God and others in our small groups relationships. Now listen, small groups are everything uh, from uh, uh, groups that meet, uh, whether it's a Bible study, but they also our small groups include like the kitchen team where they know where you are, people get to know each other, over time, they grow with each other, and we're working on more things to do training and get-togethers, our senior luncheons, all kind of things, 
places where you can get in a small group where people will know you by name. Now, here's what we're going to talk about. This is part one. We're going to talk about our salvation, and I'm going to move myself out of the way for this part. Galatians 3, 26 through 28 says this. Now, we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and we who've been baptized into union with Christ are enveloped by him. We are no longer Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free men, or even merely men and women, but we are all the same. We are Christians. We are one in Jesus Christ. Now, I won't have a lot of time to stop during this class, so you might need to pause it sometimes to fill out the blanks and other things, and hopefully I can put myself at the bottom here for a little while and uh, won't have to keep moving it. All right, welcome to our home. Here's the basics. Ephesians 2.19, this is what we want our church to be. You are a member of God's very own family, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Listen, if you want to remember our purpose statement, all you got to do is think of a home. Because we want to help people to find their way home. We want to grow in him. We want to help other people to find their way home. So it's all about home. Why? Because we're a family. Our Sunday morning services are not a show. That's too obvious sometimes. But we purposefully don't try to create something that's showy and pretend and fake where we all get a bay. Good to see you this morning. We're glad to have you here at Zerbs Nine Community Fellowship. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to be that kind of church. We want to be the kind of church that's real and honest. And even when we're funny, even when we're joking around or whatever, we want you to see God's love in us. So that's one of our key truths. All right. So here's the basics for this class. I already talked about it. And then the key truth is the church, and here's your first blank, is a family. And then the second truth is God expects you to be part of a church family. And then finally, a Christian without a church family is lonely. So you want to be part of a church family. Why? Because that's how you grow. That's how you grow in Christ. That's how you help others to know him. So why am I here? The Bible says, why am I here? If you're asking in life and everybody has that question, why am I here? Why am I where I am? Number one, because God made me to love me. God made me to love me. That's your first blank. You'll notice I underlined it there. In Jeremiah 31, three, it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then it says in Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, which you won't be able to see on the screen, even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ because of his love. God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his children. This was God's pleasure and purpose. Listen, Take just a moment and realize God wants to know you. God loves you. He cares about you. He cares about every hair on your head, the Bible says. If we would recognize how much he cares about us, it would change how we respond to him and how we respond to each other. Now, we were also, number two, created to have a personal relationship with God, but also to rule over all the rest of God's creation. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to manage it, and that makes us special. In Genesis, it says it this way. So God created human beings, making them in his image. He blessed them and said, live all over the earth, bring it under control. I am putting you in charge. In another passage, it says this. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Do you realize God made things for you to enjoy? It's okay to enjoy the beach. It's okay to enjoy the mountains. It's okay to enjoy the ocean. It's okay to enjoy music. You know, uh, uh, even when it comes uh, to us developing, there's no reason why we would have developed to desire music and other things like that. And so it's amazing to me why God wanted us to enjoy life. Then Jesus said this, I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. He doesn't want you to just tolerate life or endure life. What does God want you to do? He wants you to live life in fullness. And if you're not doing that, this class is going to help you to live life to the fullest. When we know and love God and live in harmony with his purpose for our lives, it produces tremendous benefits in our lives. So I want you to think of a, uh, just for a moment, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, if you're a Christian, what are some benefits that you see that have happened in your life because you have a relationship with God? Are there benefits in your life because you have a relationship with God? The garbage truck has decided to come by and it's very loud. <laughs> Uh, so, but what are some benefits because you have a relationship with God? Maybe you're not a Christian, but you know some Christians. What are some benefits because of those people that you know are Christians? What are some benefits of that? Number two, so what's the problem? What's the problem? 
man has a natural desire to be boss. That's your next blank. He has a natural desire to be boss. You don't have to tell a three-year-old to rebel. They do it naturally. So man has a natural desire to be boss and ignore God's principles for living. The Bible calls this attitude, next blank, sin. Sin. Listen, sin is natural. The Bible says all of us like sheep have gone astray and each of us has turned to his own way. And the, in another place in scripture, it says, if we say that we never sin, we are fooling ourselves and refuse to accept the truth. And there's another place where it says we make God a liar because the truth is we struggle with sin. By the way, over the years, I've never, well, one time, I've never had anybody but one person tell me that they don't sin. And that person was prideful. So there we go. All right. Sin breaks our close relationship with God. It causes us to fear God and try to live our lives outside as well. Think about Adam and Eve. What did they do when they realized they had blown it, when they had messed up? They ran from God. That's what we do. Isaiah 59 says, the trouble is that your sins have cut you off, off from God. I don't know why I said off. Uh, it also says in the Bible, all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious ideal. Maybe you memorized it in the glory of God. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, that's part of the Roman road that people talk about. When our relationship to God is not right, it causes problems in every area of our lives. And we all know people who struggle, whether it's in marriage, career, relationships, finances, all kinds of things when our relationship with God is not right. So what's the solution? Jesus is the solution. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Now, Jesus did not say he was a way. He didn't say he's one way. He didn't say he's one of many ways. What did he say? He said, I am the way. So here's the deal. You have to either think that scripture was written wrong and all the disciples were fooled, or you have to think that Jesus was crazy, or you have to think Jesus is God and he is who he said he is. He is the way to God. God himself came to earth as a human being to bring us back to himself. If any other way would have worked, Jesus would not have had to come. The way to eternal life is a person. It is Jesus Christ. And the deal is, like we talked about sin, the good news is Jesus has already taken care of our sin problem. That problem that pushes us away from God, Jesus has taken away from it, uh, taken that away from us. The Bible says in the book of Romans again, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why did God do this? Because he loves us and wants us to know him. In Romans 5, 8, it says, God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. While we were still separated by God, uh, from God by sin, you can tell I memorized it in a different version, Christ died for us. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, and I think this is the living translation, God is on one side, all the people are on the other side. And Christ Jesus is between them to bring them together, giving life to mankind. It's the idea of two chasms with a valley in between, and I've seen pictures of it where the cross is the bridge. Jesus is the bridge between God and us. God has already done his part to restore our relationship to him. He took the initiative. Now, he waits for each of us to individually accept what he has done for us. God gives us the choice. Are you going to receive his free gift or are you not going to receive it? So what do we do? What does God want you to do? We call it the ABCs. And by the way, if you're a Christian, have been a Christian for a long time, this is a great way to share your faith with somebody else. You can share the ABCs with them. Number one, admit that God has not been first place in your life and ask him to forgive your sins. God, I admit you're, you haven't been first place and I ask you to forgive my sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from every wrong. Number two, believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins and that he rose again on Easter and he is alive today. The second verse is this, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name Jesus by which we must be saved. That's in Acts 4, 12. By the way, that first verse is Romans 10, 9, just so you know. Number three, we confess. So we, we admit, we believe, and then we confess that we need him and receive God's free gift of salvation. Ask him to take over your life. You don't try to earn it. Religion says, God, I'm going to earn my way to you. Christianity says, you've come to me. Every religion, every religion, no matter what it is, says you do enough good things and just maybe you'll get into heaven. 
you earn your way to God. You do these seven things. You do these 10 things. You get these things straight. And then just maybe God will accept you. No, no. When you accept Jesus through confession, that's that idea of faith where you surrender to him, you are saved. For it is by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works. So no one can boast. Ephesians chapter two. By the way, we always go back to God's word. What does it say about how we get to God? It's God's word to us. Our relationship uh, with God is not restored by anything we do, but on the basis of what he already did for us. To all who receive him, he gives us the right to become children of God. All we need to do is trust him to save us. All those who believe are reborn, not a physical rebirth, but from the will of God. And this verse, Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Some great verses. That's part of the Roman road once again. Now, let's talk about baptism for a minute. We talked about what it means to be saved. And once again, that beginning part of the book, if you're a Christian and you want to help someone else become a Christian, maybe one day you're just talking to them and you say, are you a Christian? Or have you ever given your life to Christ? Or what does it mean to be a Christian? However you want to say that to them, when they start asking you questions, you can get this book out and say, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. So let's talk about baptism real quick. Baptism is part of our church. Why do we believe in baptism? Why does baptism matter? First of all, it's to follow. Why should I be baptized? To follow the example set by Christ, Mark 1, 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth and was baptized by John in the river. We know where that is even. And number two, because Christ commanded it. Jesus said, go to all people everywhere, make them my disciples. And then he says this, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 19, 20. And then number three, why should we be baptized? It demonstrates that I really am a believer. Uh, in Acts 18, 8, it says, many of the people who heard him believed and were baptized. In 1 John 2, 3, we know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. Now, Jesus told us to be baptized. For little kids, I explain it this way. Baptism is like a card you write to your mom that says, I love you, mom. And then you hand her the card. Did you already love your mom? Yes, you already loved your mom. But why are you giving her a card? You're showing her you love her. Jesus told us, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. If you love me, you're going to get baptized. You're going to be willing to let other people know that you've given your life to him. So it demonstrates that I really am a believer. So what's the meaning of baptism? What does it mean? Does it mean something? So if you've ever watched one of our baptisms, people come down, whether it's out at the beach or whether we do it at our baptism there at the church, which is between the two buildings. I don't know if you ever noticed that there. And, uh, but, but when they come down, we say to them, have you given your life to Christ? When they say yes, I say, because you've let all these people know this, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we, they go backwards or even down sometimes, and, and they go backwards and they die to themselves. That's, that's an illustration. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says it this way. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And then what do we do? We bring them up. We don't leave them down. Uh, even though families have tried to bribe me to leave their loved ones down a little longer. But it says, and he rose again. In Colossians 2.12, for when you're baptized, you're buried with Christ. And in baptism, you're also raised with Christ. Number two, it also illustrates my new life as a Christian. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. The old life has passed away. New life has come. So you go down, you die to yourself, and now you're living for Jesus. That's a, it's an illustration. By baptism, we were buried with him, Romans says, shared in his death. Why? As Christ was raised from the dead, so we may live a new life. Baptism does not make you a believer. It shows that you already believe. Baptism doesn't save you. Only your faith in Christ does that. Baptism is like a wedding ring. <clears throat> it's an outward symbol of the commitment you made in your heart. Just like that Mother's Day card from our kids, uh, hopefully that card isn't the only thing that says they love us. They love us first. Why? And then they want to give us a card. And so... That's what a wedding ring is about too. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. See, it's not something you've done. It's not baptism. It's not the Lord's Supper. It's not some other activity you've done. Grace, you've been saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So, but why should I be baptized by immersion? And I'm going to talk about in a few minutes how I was baptized as a child 
and later was baptized again. And why did I do that? Why should I be baptized by immersion? First of all, Christ was baptized that way. Matthew 3, 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Every baptism in the Bible was by immersion. For example, then there's many examples, but Acts 8, uh, then both Philip and the man went down to the water and Philip baptized him when they came up out of the water. And it goes on. Philip baptized this man. All they did was talk about what it meant to be saved. The man said, I want to be saved and I give my life to Christ. And he said, well, then we can baptize you. It doesn't require a class before you're baptized. You don't have to know everything before you're baptized, but it is good uh, in our 101 class that you get to know. And a lot of people, after they take this class, learn about baptism and then say, hey, I want that for me. <clears throat> now, the word baptize means to dip under, and the Greek word baptizo means to immerse or dip under. And then in your notes, there's also some founders of denominations that talk about the word baptize and what baptism means. Now, who should be baptized? Every person who's believed in Christ. Those who believed, Acts 2.41, and accepted his message were baptized. Simon himself believed and was baptized, 8.13. And there's tons of example, uh, Acts 8.12. Now, at Surfside, we wait until our children are old enough to believe. Now, I think I may have this on a next slide, so let me see. Here we go. At Surfside, we wait until our children are old enough to believe and understand the true meaning of baptism before we baptize them. We do something called a parent-child dedication, uh, usually once or twice a year, several times a year as a way to affirm our commitment to raise our children to know Christ. So we have those times where people want to bring their families and they bring their baby. And after COVID is over, and maybe you're watching this, it's already over. We will do these times where we say we're going to raise our children in the Lord. That doesn't save our child, but it helps our child that we say we're going to bring them up to know Christ. At Surfside, it's also a membership requirement that every member must have been baptized the way Jesus demonstrated, even though many of us were confirmed as children. I was baptized as a child. Later, when I was in high school, I wanted to really surrender my life to Christ on my own, and I did. And about a year later, I was looking back, and I thought, you know, when I got baptized as a child, I really uh, I didn't do it for me. I really did it for my parents. I really did it for other things. And so I decided, you know what? I want to be baptized by immersion the way Jesus was. And so as a commitment to Christ, I took those steps. Now, I will tell you, it was very difficult. And I'll tell you this, too. Um, when we first started, when I first started teaching this class, I had a couple that was in their mid 60s who had been baptized as children. And they said, hey, you mean I got to get baptized again, even though I was sprinkled as a kid, I got to get baptized again in order to be a part of your church. And I said, listen, you can do everything in our church except vote on the budget as a as a part of the church uh, uh, without being a member. You don't you don't have to be a member of our church. There's things you can't vote on. But, you know, that we don't vote on a lot of stuff anyway. But you can be a part of a small group. You can help be a part of ministries. You know, there's all kind of things as a non-member you can be part of. There's just a few things you can't uh, uh, do as a non-member. I said, but you pray about the most important thing. What does God want you to do? Do you think, after reading all this, that God would want you to be baptized? Just a few weeks before this class, I had this conversation uh, with a young man, and he was talking about how he was baptized as a child, but he wasn't a Christian and that recently gave his life to Christ. But he wasn't sure he wanted to be baptized. And so I gave him this information. And I talked to him a little bit. I gave him my story. And just recently he came to me and said, Eric, I want to be baptized. That older couple came back to me a few weeks later. They had prayed about it. They talked about it. They were terrified, but they were my first ever jacuzzi baptism. They got baptized in a jacuzzi and, and it was the coolest pictures ever, but they wanted to show other people they gave their lives to Christ through obedience. And I always say this, listen, Anytime you obey Jesus, he brings new freedoms in your life. And maybe that difficulty you're struggling with is because of an area where you haven't been obedient to Christ. Look at all those areas and be obedient. All right. There's no reason to delay. If you've decided to receive Christ in your life, you can and should be baptized. If you wait till you're perfect, you'll never feel good enough. And so it's an act of faith, even being baptized, going, I've surrendered to him. In Acts 8, 35 to 38, Philip says to this Ethiopian eunuch, hey, look, here's water. Let's get you baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch actually says, hey, I want to get baptized. And he said, if you believe with all your heart. And here's what he said, and I love this, and let me move that out of the way. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they went down in the water, and Philip baptized him. What a great example of what it means. And you can look that up in Acts 8, uh, 35 to 38. All right, let's talk about the Lord's Supper real quick, and then we'll be done with this section. What's the Lord's Supper? 1 Corinthians 11 talks about it, and that's what we're going to use for our text. 
It's a simple act. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. He could have done something complicated, but what did he do? He took bread. Number two, it's a symbol. It's a symbol. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Now, they were looking at Jesus. They didn't think that Jesus literally meant, I'm pulling my body off and giving it to you. No, he took bread and said, this is my body. And then he said, eat it in remembrance of me. So it's also a reminder. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it to remember me. And this refers back to the old covenant, which was the blood over the doors when they came out for the Passover. And Jesus was saying, I'm the new Passover lamb. And then finally, in verse 26, it is a statement. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. Who should take the Lord's Supper? Only those who are already saved. For anyone who drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. We will never embarrass someone who's not a believer or is too young to understand the Lord's Supper. God knows the heart. I remember years ago being at a church and a little kid was probably four years old and they were passing down the elements and the kid took the cracker and the juice and the usher or the deacon or whoever it was reached in and took that away from the child and said, you're not ready for this. Listen, number one, I don't know how they thought they knew whether or not that child was ready. Number two, you know what? I think that deacon, what they did was more rude and mean than that kid, maybe not fully understanding. So anyway, we're always very careful with that. But I would say when you have friends come to church that maybe aren't Christians, maybe talk to them. And listen, for some people, they may even become Christians during the Lord's Supper. We've had that happen because I typically will explain what it means to be a Christian. Now, who should take the Lord's Supper? Jesus never asked his disciples to remember his birth. That's Christmas. <laughs> but he did instruct him to remember his death and resurrection. He gave the church two visible symbols. We don't we call them ordinances as reminders of his death. These are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Both are object lessons, and they represent a great spiritual truth for believers. So they're ways of us showing what they are. We don't call them sacraments because sacrament implies that one of those things saves us. You're already saved, but it's a way of remembering and doing what Jesus called us to do. Now, how do I prepare? There are several things, and this 1 Corinthians verse talks about it. I prepare by self-examination. Look at my heart. And I'll do this every time we take the Lord's Supper together. And by the way, you can take Lord's Supper in small groups. You can even take it with your family. I'd be glad to give you uh, some preparation if you'd like to take it just with your family. Confessing my sins. Listen, you want to have a pure heart before God. Looking and saying, God, renew my heart recommitment. That's that renewing, that recommitment. God, I, I want to take care of these things in my life. And then finally, restoring relationships. It talks about in scripture, you leave that gift to the altar and go make things right whenever possible. It's not always possible, but as far as it depends on you, the Bible says, live at peace with all men. So that's what we do. Now, when and how often? Well, Jesus never said when and how often we did it. And my notes have gotten a little messed up, but he never told us how often. Some churches do it every week. Some churches do it every month. Some churches do it every quarter. Some churches do it once a year. I know churches that do it once a year. Here's the deal. The Bible never tells us. It's not a sin to do it more or do it less. We all have our preferences. We try to do it enough as a church that it's a regular ordinance, and we try not to do it so much that it becomes normal. We want it to always be a special time. We're always finding that balance, and we do it oftentimes. Uh, we'll do it occasionally at our morning services or even our Saturday night service. But often, we always do it when we have a family gathering. For example, when we gather for our picnics or things like that, we always do the Lord's Supper together. So that's why we do that. You can read about that more. Now, we're going to do part two next, and I'll be coming.